Okay, so what I want to do, and I hope this is going to be the most useful for, for all of you, is I want to, in a, in, a, in a general way, say, what are we doing and what should we be doing to really improve survival? Not just progression-free survival. How can we help metastatic breast cancer patients live longer, have a higher chance of going into remission, and possibly those, those, those few that can actually be cured from metastatic breast cancer? And this is the treatment approach. It is absolutely vital that time is spent in talking to you uh, and um, examining you if you've got symptoms to try and assess where and what your breast cancer is doing. Yes, you absolutely need to do blood tests because that will tell you whether the cancer is actually starting to interfere with your organ function and that's a really important part of assessing what's happening uh, with the, the pace of your cancer. You absolutely have to have uh, x-rays and scans and I know that many, and uh, I must admit, I don't know what's happening. Maybe, maybe you're just getting tired of me sighing. But many of you are now accepting the need to have scans without uh, being worried about uh, the radiation exposures. But you've got to look at the balance of benefit versus harm. Yes, in the natural population, you don't want to be getting uh, extra radiation than you need because obviously with the atomic bomb, radiation causes cancer. But can I just say to you that never in my professional lifetime has the number of scans I've done on a patient harmed a patient. I have never had one case of radiation-induced cancer. However, if you don't do the scans at the appropriate time, you may not know what's going on with your cancer. And the worst thing is to, to be behind the eight ball, left the cancer growing for an extra three months because you didn't want to do the scan then, and then find out that it was now double the size. Uh, PET scans uh, in 2019, no, 2020 has now become uh, on Medicare. So again, it's not the end or be all scan. It is to be selected for a particular purpose in different patients, um, but it is an extra way of imaging uh, that might be useful for some patients. And probably the most important thing, and you know, we've published on this and there's increasing evidence on this, and it is now in the international guidelines. It is always important to consider biopsying one of the secondary tumors if the response to the treatment is not behaving the way you expect it to, in a, a woman already diagnosed with breast cancer that is stage four, uh, and in many, many, many women who have had breast cancer years ago and the cancer uh, is suspected to have come back, a metastasis uh, biopsy is really, really important. So this is a message that I hope is going ac across the land and uh, many people are doing this now. So this is just sort of a table of all the things that I look at when I make a clinical evaluation of the treatment uh, that you should be getting. Um, and as you can see, it's not just one thing. So sometimes I have a patient say to me, uh, you know, my estrogen receptor status is only 5%. Shouldn't I be having chemotherapy? You know, the hormones aren't gonna work. And that might be correct, but it may also be incorrect based on all these other factors. So the tumor burden. How long ago did you have breast cancer before it came back? Is where your cancer secondaries are life-threatening? And that is the most important point. Because if as an oncologist, uh, it is determined that where your secondary breast cancer could potentially kill you in the next three months, you almost always have to have chemotherapy, irrespective of what kind of breast cancer you have. Other things are, you know, what are your preferences? Um, women will say to me, Arlene, my experience with chemotherapy was so bad because of mouth ulcers and hair loss, I really don't want to go through that again. But you've got to remember, uh, hair loss and mouth ulcers aren't uniform side effects of every single chemotherapy. Many of you have had the um, advantage of using the cold cap machine, so hair loss isn't always necessarily a, a side effect to be dreaded. Um, it depends on how physiologically fit you are. It depends on what your menopausal status is. It depends on whether you've got rheumatoid arthritis, diabetes, heart disease, and other things going on. It depends on what your mood is and how you're coping with your illness and other issues with psychological factors in the past. It may be completely inappropriate to start someone on aggressive, toxic treatment um, if she's just going to not, be, you know, she's going to give up after one week of treatment. So all these factors, plus the cost, plus the travel time plus the impact on your family life, your children, your work, all these things go into the mix in my brain and um, uh, essentially in, in oncologists' brains when they're looking at how best to treat this patient. Uh, but ultimately, be assured that the goal of the treatment always is longer survival, best quality of life, least side effects. So that heads everything, 
but you take all these other factors into consideration. So as I said, some of the things that we look at is tumor biology and tumor burden, and just very, very quickly, yes, it is possible for patients who had HER2 negative breast cancers to then have breast cancers that become HER2 positive. But there are also publications showing that patients who had HER2 positive breast cancers can lose the HER2 receptor. Uh, we were one of the publications that showed that in a study of over 110 patients, there was no patient that actually gained a HER2 receptor. But having said that, this is the importance of doing biopsies. The same can happen for ER uh, and PHAR status. You can have these rates of positive to negative, but you can also have negative to positive of those rates. So if somebody recommends for you to have a biopsy for these purposes, you can understand what's being done. The next thing we look at um, is looking at what are the uh, consequences of any previous treatments that you've had. Do you have terrible tingling in your fingers? Have you had um, cardiac dysfunction from treatments or from other health issues? Are you allergic to certain drugs? How bad were you affected with nausea and vomiting? And so it's really important to know how your experience in the past has been with a particular family of drugs when discussing and recommending the next line of treatment. Choice of treatment variably comes down to clinical trials. Nobody who has metastatic breast cancer should be treated outside of results of a clinical trial. And that's just a statement of fact. Um, and just to show you what has happened, this is to hopefully give you um, excitement and hope to look at all those different drugs that are available. And this is how we look at it. We look at trials that have included hundreds and thousands of patients. We essentially look at whether the tumors are endocrine responsive or not. The next thing we ask is, are they HER2 positive or not? And then we go through all those things that I've talked to you about on previous slides in choosing the best drug. And very importantly, if you do have uh, secondaries uh, of a significant load in your bones, particularly if they're lytic, so that is the, the cancer has gone into the bones and it's actually making a hole in it, you need to have bone-targeted drugs discussed and you need to have all your symptoms managed alongside the treatment. And this very quick slide just shows you, and this is a bit outdated, it's about a year old. All the drugs on the right have been evaluated for breast cancer. Much, much more than any other cancer types. A little bit disappointingly, the ones in yellow are the ones that are available in PBS. Now, having said that, I'll just go backwards. Although many of these drugs have been evaluated, not all of them have yet been shown to improve either progression-free survival or overall survival. So don't just feel that, oh, there were all those other effective drugs and they're not available. These are other factors. What's your ethnic group? And that impacts on the, the rates of polymorphisms and how your body pharmacologically handles drugs. Do you have other health issues? What's your preference? And all the things that I've talked to you about. So these things all come out in the decision making of what you should be getting. And that's my take home message. You want the best results, you gotta take all these factors into consideration for every individual patient. And I stress the individual bit because obviously there are many, many, many women in the community with uh, breast cancer, some with early, some with advanced. And obviously you will have friends and family members um, with breast cancer, and it's a real danger in comparing what worked for them, what didn't work for them, and trying to uh, imp uh, you know, use that information to feel confident or not confident about the treatments that are recommended for you. Don't do that. You're being treated as an individual, you take that into account first and foremost. So just <coughs> close to finishing, um, metastatic breast cancer is treated very differently to early breast cancer. Uh, I think that there are very clear guidelines, there's availability of drugs, and there is absolutely no excuse for not using high level evidence to make treatment choices. We are very, very conscious here at BCRCWA of the importance of family members, husbands, carers, supporters, because you are an integral part of how to manage and give the best results for your loved one who has breast cancer. We continue to strive in doing clinical trials. Uh, we are very excited because we have a multidisciplinary team of specialists, nurses, allied health, clinical psychologists. And what I'd just like to show you is that these are the 12 international published guidelines by the Advanced 
Breast Cancer Consensus Consortium. And um, those things that I've highlighted, I've already talked about in my preceding uh, uh, slides. And I think it all goes towards how this is a recognized approach. So no single woman anywhere in the world should not be treated in accordance with these guidelines. Uh, so just uh, finally, just give you a bit of an update. We have 30 active trials ongoing, and hopefully you'll be encouraged that 22 of them are focused on metastatic breast cancer. Um, the trial that I talked to you about before is a study called LAMS. That was the acronym was devised by a very clever young lady, and um, it's called the Longitudinal Analysis of Metastatic Breast Cancer Survival. And what we're going to do, and it has been done by others around the world, but probably not in the same fashion, is that we're going to review um, data in over 950 women, because I've seen, as I said, over um, 1,000 patients with metastatic breast cancer, who actually have accurate information in terms of their follow-up, the treatment they received, and their outcome. Outcome in terms of death, outcome in terms of progression-free survival. And we're going to try and publish on this to be to, for, for two purposes. One, to give you guys hope that there really can be the possibility of good outcomes. And number two, to really try to advise um, the community as to how the best approaches should be taken in an outside clinical trial environment to get the best results and the best survival rates. Uh, we've just started this uh, study. We've got ethics approved. So hopefully we'll have it published maybe by this time next year. But just to give you a little snippet of information already, we've already reviewed some of the published work, and the mo one of the most recent published data came from Philadelphia from 2019. They looked at uh, 1,400 patients with metastatic breast cancer. They had an 8% incidence of women living over five years. Now, compared to published data, that might sound a little bit low to you, but it's probably not that bad. We've just had a quick look at our data, and to date, of our over 950 patients, we have an incidence of 24% of patients survive over five years. So that is a proof of concept that following guidelines using evidence-based treatment can really give you the best results. We do have three immunotherapy trials going. We've got an oral chemotherapy trial going. We have a national study looking at eribolin. This is a chemotherapy that some of you have received to really try and advise oncologists how best to use this drug. We have um, drugs looking at uh, endocrine positive uh, patients with the new drug. We have uh, a trial that we're probably going to be initiating together with a friend of mine from uh, the UK looking at non-chemotherapy agents. And we have a whole lot of molecular biology studies that we're initiating uh, from BCRCWA and hopefully it will be published within the next year to two. And so this is just future things. You know, how can we use um, what we know about biology to benefit patients? We really, really, really need to spend more time and more efforts and get better results for women who have spread of the cancer to the brain. How do we make new, these new agents affordable? Um, and how best to use the information that we uh, gain from the laboratory to translate into the best uh, consistent high quality of care for all patients. 